Well, I do tell stories, but I wouldn't call myself a storyteller after hearing uh, this tonight. Um, I have actually two totally separate comments. One was when you play with Google, what is that doing? What is that doing to your imagination or, or to your learning? And I think it's creating ADD because you go down one path and you find another thing to look up, then you find another thing and you're off and mm. so many different tangents. And I really wonder how that's going to affect children in the future as far as focusing on one topic. That's one. Studies have shown that an excessive amount of, 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 of cognitive leaping mm -hmm. does engender a, a, a cognitive habit, otherwise known as ADD. That's what I Imagine you thinking. have uh, an, a, a sort of a, a flat lake as far as the eye can see, and it's absolutely placid, and you're good at skipping stones. This is an eternal lake, and it's an eternal stone, and you skip it, and off it goes. I, I can, uh, the best I've ever done was 15 skips. Mm -hmm. on very so flat wow. water. But this doesn't stop. There's momentum and just continues. Imagine you're just skipping across the water into eternity. Now, there's a relationship that you have with the water. You're touching it and you're sampling it at a great distance with taps, of, of, if you'll follow the, follow the image. Whereas, the, then another way to ask yourself, well, what is knowledge, is if the stone just stops and sinks, then you're down in the water, and that's a very different way of knowing the water. And so I think there, there's a question there uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, mm. that I, I think is worth an, a good examination. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. I, I've now, uh, I have one room in the house with no electronic media. <laughs> and uh, this happened purely by accident that I went into that room to read a book, and it was just so wonderful. <laughs> there was no email. I, mm -hmm. I, I didn't worry about the phone. You know, I could, but now I turn off the phones when I go in. And that is, I don't think any 18-year-old would ever do that, would be mm -hmm. separated from a phone or IM or anything like that for that, for as long as I go into that room. Mm -hmm. So, so. Google, I, you know, there, there is this um, magic of that experience where you can gather so much information in so short a time. The things that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I and my colleagues spent days in libraries trying to find out is right there at your fingertips. So, but uh, your uh, metaphor, your trope is exactly right. You know, what about that? And I think there's experience. a value to being able to find that information so quickly. I use it all yeah. the time. Yeah. <laughs> right. I don't know how many of you, but uh, yeah. writing stories, doing anything, Guilty. there it is. And, and it's, it's a wonder. Uh, right. Yeah. All right. Well, okay. Second question, not related to the first, and then I will step back. Um, I know, well, I know like, what I loved about your storytelling was that you added the music to it besides the sound effects. And to me, I, I know a, a, a little bit about the brain, and so what you were using was the right side of the brain for the music and the left side for the, the language part of it. And I just wondered, I'm, I'm actually working on a children's story right now. I've already written the story once, and I've told it to about 300 children, and at the end I said, I like this story, but I would like it better if it was in rhyme, and maybe I could be Dr. Seuss. <laughs> well, I'm not Dr. Seuss. It's taking forever to do it. But there's something about the alliteration, about the rhyming, about the musical prosody, and I'm just wondering, have you ever told stories without your harp? And why did you choose to add that side to it, which it enhances it, in my opinion. But. Hmm. The only stories I tell a cappella are Paul Bunyan stories and crazy really? accent. But most of the stories uh, I tell have a score of some sort, either on the harp or the 12-string guitar or other instruments, African sanza at times. What made you do that? Why did you decide My mother to was a musician. Oh. I have a music gene. <laughs> How did you get into this? That's another question. <laughs> but, I mean, what do you think about the right side and the left side of the brain? coming together for yeah, that storytelling. Uh, if, if, if it felt as if it was a harmonic kind of uh, experience, that's all the better. Plus, it goes all the way back to that, uh, that again, ancient experience of early, early storytelling. I think there was very often a throbbing musical component. Mm -hmm. 
drumming. drums and mm -hmm. dancing and mm -hmm. drama and storytelling and chant and all that very ancient, uh, you know, early uh, uh, quasi worship from the ancient, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Paleolithic days, I think still carries a kind of, of memory that we, that we have, that we work with. And perhaps that's why music uh, is helpful. That's Plus, true. you know, you go to a movie, my goodness, think how they manipulate your emotions. With the music. <laughs> what would Star Wars be without dun, 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 dun. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, indeed, indeed. Funny. <clears throat> I find it a little funny. Um, I really appreciate your focus um, in many of your focuses, foci, whatever. <laughs> but what I'm not hearing, which is kind of odd, in a, kind of odd in a way, because the, the uh, history of the Cambridge Forum has been related to social justice a lot of times. And I'm, I'm hearing um, a lot of interesting stories uh, with music and uh, people and situations, but I was just looking, I was just in New Jersey and I was watching PBS and um, I saw something about a, a Lewis and Clark um, kind of like an opera or something like that and interwoven into it was a struggle of the Native Americans and how they, they viewed Lewis and Clark and that was like a story being told juxtaposed onto the Lewis and Clark program and it was a story of struggle and social justice. I saw it to be, actually. And I'm actually here because I've been thinking about reviving a storytelling group um, with, in, in, in like uh, the venue of peer advocacy with people who have um, been up against psychiatric oppression, actually. And you know, some have had a more of a um, moderate reaction to it, and some have had a severe reaction to it and some like their therapists. But the point is, is that if the story wasn't told when a person was psychiatrically oppressed, then it, it, wouldn't, have been as, it wouldn't have been as effective, you know. So the story, again, that would be kind of like social justice in a way. It's related, um, psychiatry and the abuses of it is also a social justice issue too, or a civil rights issue. So what I'm wondering, um, odds and anybody else, if there's a uh, social justice focus, and I don't think you're leaving it out, I think that what you're saying is very alive and refreshing and creative, but I'm wondering if there's a social justice focus, whether it's uh, from a Native American or a psychiatric client or a um, person from the Holocaust or a, a black person, whether there's some kind of um, social justice focus that indeed um, is it's compelling, it becomes compelling, if, um, if there's a story behind it to really empower the situation, if, there's, if, if you could just come up with a focus that was one of your, maybe one of your favorite social justice focuses for telling a story. Sure. I told the Rage of Hercules in uh, the Men's Honor Farm out in California, told it uh, to adjudicated youth we have something called the Hercules process, where there were you know, kids in the slammer who have genuine rage issues are able to hear a story. It's called The Rage of Hercules. It's 100 minutes long. I do a 50-minute version. And it's about the, the genuine Hercules who you never hear about, who was a murderous and crazy person, killed his family, his music teacher, and, and had to achieve expiation by doing his 12 labors and that he was truly a, a, a sociopath and had a very, very tragic life. So one of the stories that I tell is called The Rage of Hercules and then there's a process where the kids ha answer a whole series of questions. And uh, I was, uh, I was uh, gosh, what is it? St Stanislaus County uh, Youth Correctional Facility. Um, it was the first person ever led in to this place. The kids came in like this, the pepper spray, the uh, guns. If, if I was told, if, uh, if you hear down, you better hit the floor, <laughs> otherwise you'll be pepper sprayed as well. So in this, and it was the first time that the girls were allowed in the same room with the boys. These are explosive children. And I found it a great and interesting challenge to, uh, to, to 
present the story to them. And they were lifted out and they were, and, and they were questioning their, the, the, the seat of their own fury. And so, yes, their, their storytelling can take so many forms and do so many different things. The story I offered you tonight was pretty light fare. <laughs> but no, indeed, and I know that psychiatrically, you'd be the expert here. Uh, you should ask Sasha more than me. Yeah, if you'd like to make a comment, I'd appreciate it if you'd like to. Psychiatric, I mean, stories, how stories can empower a, a psychiatric uh, oppression or whatever. Yeah, sure. I, I guess it's a very complicated um, way to think through things, but one thing you try to do with patients, or I try to do, is to help them find their story, their narrative. And whether it's accurate to what really happened in their life may be somewhat less important than that it makes sense to them that they blossomed into the person that they are today based on the narrative that they have created for themselves. And there's some peaceful settling to doing that. Yeah, I just don't, I don't uh, work in a, in a clinic or a hospital, but it's just the term patience is used there, but I just, you know, we just say uh, uh, members of a, of a uh, community um, or clients usually. But, I, you know, just I guess if you're in a hospital setting, they do use the word patients, but, you know, it depends on what setting you're in. Right. Okay, thank you. But I was thinking about what you were saying, Odds, which is storytelling is active and the audience is passive, and then you trade off and they become, become active then. Oh, absolutely. There's an entire feedback process where the many, many questions are asked. And the, you just use the story as the, much the way a fairy tale will help a very young child work through sort of like, a, it's, a, it's a complex whirly gig. Bruno Bettelheim talked a lot about this in his Uses of Enchantment book about how a fairy tale Sometimes a child will want to hear it over and over and over again because it has a salutary effect. It allows them to feel unconscious feelings and have release of those unconscious feelings while imagining. And the, the great, the, the, the myths, the heavy myths, such as the Hercules myth, for older kids, I've found, has that same kind of uh, vicarious release mechanism. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there is a book by Mark Saltzman who, um, it, it's called True Notebooks, and he also went to a juvenile detention center where most of the juveniles had committed murder and were awaiting trial to be tried as adults, and he taught them how to write. And they wrote their stories, which were quite beautiful, and he includes them in the book. Um, and it, it helped all of them, the, sad, the sadness of the stories, well, the sadness of his book is that as they wrote their stories, they were peeling off to go to court and be jailed for the rest of their lives. But I guess they felt a little bit better, <laughs> uh, it seemed. I mean, they felt better for the writing. Yeah, absolutely. Once upon a time, I worked on a, a radio drama series, and <clears throat> I was reminded of that experience when you're making your water drips in the cave and blowing of the wind. and. Uh, we did 19th century American fiction, and I had to help create the sound of the Mississippi River and of the cave where Huckleberry Finn went with Jim, and uh, just you know, creating the acoustic landscape and uh, doing uh, storytelling on the radio was a wonderful experience. Um, and other stories that I've enjoyed uh, over time are especially our uh, Marco Polo stories, which uh, began to sort of weave in and out of real experience and real travels and some some fictional. Uh, exaggeration or whatever, hyperbole, and uh, now I'm sort of interested in stories that introduce me to different cultures and especially uh, different places in the world, sort of geographical stories. But obviously there's so many different uh, types of stories, so many things to say about stories. What are some of your favorite stories the, uh, diff from different cultural traditions that have deeply influenced either of you? And uh, to bring it to the point, what is the sort of shortest story that you know? Well, you have to you want to hear the that. shortest story? <laughs> this is the shortest story, and it's from far away. It's from the Mahabharat, uh, the, the great Sanskrit poem that informs uh, 
uh, Hinduism, one of the two, the other is the Ramanya. And uh, this is the story, this is the shortest story I know. Kausika the Brahmana, who is now roasting in hell, set himself never to tell a lie. And when the murderers ran after their victim and asked Kausika the Brahmana, where are they? He did not lie, and he said, he went that way. <laughs> That's the I'll, shortest I'll, story. I'll tell a less I cryptic know. one. <laughs> this is one that uh, I always use with my students uh, because they create the story in their heads. And all I have to do is say, a girl, a wolf, the woods. And they have the story. But each one has a different ver. They then have to tell the story. And each version is different. Astonishingly. <laughs> I think um, Ernest Hemingway wrote a six word short story, and I, I think it was mm -hmm. New Baby Shoes for Sale. I think that was it. And why were, I mean, I conjured up the image that the baby had died, they had bought the shoe. I mean, you don't know what happened, but that's all he wrote. That was it. Or if you think of Nabokov, uh, actually, Humbert Humbert in Lolita explaining how his mother died, and all he says is, picnic, lightning. So there are these word pictures that conjure up a lot. I have another question. Um, you, you both seem to have a love-hate relationship with the electronic age, and you cuddle with the Kindle, but you have the room with no electronics in it. And you love to look things up on Google, but you are very, I mean, it's, it's your person and your fingers and your instrument and your voice that's telling the story. It's not out there on a screen somewhere. So clearly we're, you're immigrants in this new electronic world. As this world, be, more and more people in the world become natives of the electronic world, what do you think is going to last in storytelling? What will be brought forward from the time of the Iliad in storytelling in the electronic age when everybody is a native of the electronic age? I think that certain stories have lasting power. If a story's been told and retold for thousands of years or by hundreds of generations of people, I don't think that's going to disappear simply because there is a new way for young people to experience story. I think that someone will find a way to take those ancient and great stories and reclothe them in the new technologies. At least I'd like to think that. I think that we're, it, it's so, so newly arrived with all of this new technology. We've lived with it for how many years? Five years? Six years? <laughs> it's so fresh and it's, and, it, and it's so explosively created every day. And there are new devices and, and new entire activities, social activities to do every day. And I think people are so, sort of awash in the delight of it, much like perhaps in Plato's time, certain people were awash in the delight of that written word, and there were lots of warriors. Hmm. Uh, but I think that over time, if we become uh, acquainted more deeply with these, these technologies, that eventually, I would hope, the, those great stories will find their way back through that, that wonderful n new form. I think you're right. I mean, I looked at Robin Hood movies, if we look at movies as a form of electronics, and between the 30s and the year 2000, there were about 40 different versions of Robin Hood in movie form. And I thought, somebody needs Robin Hood. A lot of people need Robin Hood <laughs> if they keep making the story over and over and over again from various uh, slants and, and different characters' perspectives in real person form and animated form. 
-hmm. So are movies our new folklore? I and, think so. Yeah. I was wondering what you thought about the movie Across the Street, um, Sendak's film, and you know the background story of Max is filled in, and his parents apparently got a divorce, and there's a lot of sadness and trouble, <laughs> other than just oh, his being yeah. pissed off about oatmeal and, and his hunger. Um, I wondered if you felt that was, again, not helping kids use their imagination, that the background stories filled in. Well, I think Spike Jones is using his imagination and creating something completely new, really. You know, it's based on the book and it's where the wild things are, but it's completely different. And it's, I think, really more for adults than for children, although there are many children who see it and, and think it's wonderful. And then you have Dave Eggers' uh, novel yeah. based on the film. So uh, it begins to become a piece of folk. Max is in some ways a folk hero. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that there are people telling, telling that story and not just reading it from, from a book. Well, the other piece is your idea about imagination. Sendak wanted Max to experience all this in his imagination. In the movie and Egger's novel, it occurs in real space. Max actually leaves the house. It's not what he imagines happening in his own home in the safety of his house. So, um, you know, again, I'm not sure with the interface with imagination. I think if I had seen the film or read the new novel, <laughs> I'd have much more to offer. It still might be a dream, I would say. Um, even, even the film uh, makes the idea of it's being a dream a possibility. But I agree, once it, it's there on screen, it becomes much more real. And, yeah. Do you have a question? I'm part of a group that gets together and does a lot of singing um, of old songs, new songs, but we write ancient ballads, whatever we can come across, which is, you know, a form of storytelling in and of itself. And something we've encountered a lot of the time, or at least I have, and I know a few of the others in the group have, is that there are songs that we absolutely love, and you want to take it and share it with people, and you realize you can't sing it. It's not your story, and you just can't sing it in such a way that it can convey the story the way you heard it, the person you learned it from. And I was wondering if this is something you've ever encountered, if there's a story that maybe you love and you wanted to share and you actually came across and you, you actually couldn't put yourself into it enough to fully tell it, and how with um, all the modern electronic ways we can preserve and share and the internet and everything, how more stories are able to be conveyed to a larger audience that may not have been able to get the full feeling otherwise. There are two issues there. Number one is yeah. there, are, there are people uh, uh, who, uh, would absolutely prohibit you from telling their stories because they border upon the sacred and they're part of their religious tradition and hands off. And then there are other stories. Oh yeah, there are so many stories that I, I would love to be able to tell but, but, but couldn't. Uh, I just try to find stories that fit what it is that uh, I feel and I clothe myself in those and all the other ones that I would like to tell but I'm incapable of doing. I set them aside and let other storytellers tell them. Yeah, that, that's such an interesting question. That, you know, what stories do we connect with and why? Um, and what are you then compelled to retell or reconfigure? Because it's never the same as the way you heard it or read it. Um, it becomes your, your story. Yeah, the, the story, the, the, the Dame Ragnell, was penned by Chrétien de Toyer, a, a, you know, a 14th century courtly French poet, who also did a, 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 mm -hmm. a wonderful version of, of, of Percival, and, and uh, also did a beautiful story. I, I love his stories, one called the, the, um, the Winter Cherries, which is about an old knight who goes to Uther Pendragon, and, disguises himself and is extorted out of his boon on the way in and ends up asking as his boon on the way out to be able to deliver 12 blows on the head where they're most deserved. Uh, the, 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 those are stories from the, 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 the courtly French poets uh, where interestingly the, the, some of the very earliest uh, feminist stories began to re-emerge 
to my understanding, in European culture. I just want to thank both of you. This has been enchanting. Um, you know, I felt that with your harp, that you are actually kind of holding a dialogue or a conversation. It seemed more than just an accompaniment. Um, but it gets me to a deeper question, which is, where do you go when you're telling your stories? You manage to step into so many different people's shoes, turning on a dime. And the power, I don't know whether it's just rote or are you emotionally inhabiting these people. Um, the whole point of a story at some level is to, well, if we weren't empathetic animals to start off with, stories would get us nowhere. So I'm wondering your powers of empathy with your characters. Um, yeah, what happens when you tell your stories? Because clearly you enchant us. We go into a kind of trance state. And I'm wondering where you are in all of this. Oh, I'm right in that very same spot. I really feel a lot for my characters. They're, uh, there are a great many of them. The, 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 it's, it's, a, it's an act of imagining where there's a point of view. And if you can imagine yourself in the body looking out of the eyes of a character, then that really, at least in the way I do this sort of work, assists me immensely. Mm -hmm. Because I'm visualizing the story from within the eyes of the character. It's not over there, but it's rather journeying around through the eyes of the character so that they can see each other and speak to each other. And then as far as the music goes, it's an extemporaneous kind of activity. Uh, I've played the harp a long time now, and uh, when a certain sort of moment comes, there are a certain number of light motifs, light motif, like a Wagnerian light motif. It's a it's like dun, 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 dun. That's, a, that's one of John Williams' best light motifs, <laughs> yes? And uh, so I have a bunch that, I, that I'll pull out to, um, to either make it, if you go to a minor key, then that will, in the listener, hopefully signal that, oh, well, this isn't all, all you know, sunlight and flowers. And, but then if you go to an, an, a sort of a major key and there's something sprightly happening, then hopefully that adds to the mood of the listener, and, and there's an elevation and a sort of a, a different uh, feeling to the, to the story. So is every performance different? I mean, it's none of it's wrote. Every, none of these has ever been written down. Uh, they're storytellings. They're all, they always say something a little different. The music is always a little different. Mm -hmm. but, but I have a, 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 a body of ideas that I call upon. But so, no, I've never told the same story the same really, way twice ever. Really, that's interesting. Yeah, because earlier you talked about the Star Wars movie as sort of manipulative, emotionally manipulative. But well, just your stories all, all are movie all, music, all right, movie music. But also, so a lot of stories and the music you play. Are you consciously trying to manipulate the emotions of your audience? Yeah. <laughs> it's part of the entertainment. That's right. Yeah. Okay, and I, I, so I, I have another. Half. Manipulate is, is, is a word that right. perhaps we could, we could adjust slightly. Right. Um, uh, excite with, perhaps, is, is the way I look at it, or enhance fr from. <laughs> so though that's more the way I look at it. Well, you know, because also going back to the ancient stories, you know, the tradition that you come from, and this is actually a question for both of you, um, a lot of the stories that resonate, there are good guys and bad guys, and um, the good guys are always part of your group, part of your community, maybe it's even you, and the bad guys are the ones out there, the competitors. A lot of the games, the, you know, the um, video games, your good guys, you know, killing, fighting, you know, slicing up bad guys. And so there's a dark side to storytelling as well, and I'm sure you've contemplated, but maybe could say a few words about that as much as you're, you're making everybody around you within the, if they're hearing the story, they're feeling good, they're part of the group, but often they're conjuring up negative emotions towards people who are not part of your community. Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, I free associated immediately to where the wild things are, the Eggers novel, which is all about that. 
Uh, and that's why the place that the wild things inhabit is so deeply problematic, because everything's always getting divided up into good guys, bad guys. Uh, there is conflict, there's war, there's melodrama. And of course, you need conflict in stories. Uh, you know, otherwise there's no there's no story. You know, they're and always the going to be. You know, I heard uh, also on NPR that Maurice Sendak, um, the roots of his stories, and also in the Night Kitchen, I believe, really had to do with being the child. I think he was the child of Holocaust survivors. And believe it or not, this these stories, and I'm rem I'm forgetting the exact details of it, have their origins in his experience as the child of parents and relatives who had experienced Nazi Germany. So talk about good guys and bad guys. Oh, yeah. Well, let me just turn to In the Night Kitchen, which is a, puts a little different spin on it, uh, where, again, you know, Sendak is, I think, in that book, trying to help children uh, in those moments when they feel alone and abandoned. And what can you do then? You can use your imagination. You can go into the night kitchen and you can make something. You, you, you become Homo Faber, uh, the creator of artifacts. You make an airplane that takes you away. And then you take the dough and create the cake. So uh, there, I think, yes, you, know, you do have this um, division between good and evil. But there are also stories which show you how to use your imagination to overcome um, some of the evils in your own life. Uh, as for the, the wild things, I, I recall that Sendak talked about the wild things as his Jewish relatives who would come and pinch him on the cheek and tell him, oh, you're so good, I could eat you up. Right. Um, but of course, you know, the Holocaust experience too, where many of his relatives died in the Holocaust. He was also ill as a child. So there was a, you know, he was a child who was, I think, obsessed with death. And, but there's some other questions, and we should, probably, yeah. thanks. Well, the, the first is just a, a comment, um, which I think ties into what you all were talking about, which is the Maya Angelou quote that I'm not going to say perfectly, which is, there's no greater agony than bearing an untold story. Um, and in essence, carrying something that you need to share, but not being able to do that. And so I was really reminded about the beauty of being able to tell your story and the narrative and the question that came before about social justice. I think being able and being invited to tell your story is so important. But I actually wanted to hear from both of you more about the issue of performance. Um, and I think teachers perform, I think storytellers perform. That, that is, to, to get the story across, there is a performance. And since we're talking about creativity, I'd love to know where the sources, what you draw on to be present in a way in front of your students, in front of those who come to hear the story. And I think that would help all of us to be able to maybe think about how we're channeling whatever we're channeling sure. to get there. And we'd love to, I'd love to hear both of you on that. Oh, well, I think that everyone walks around with a whole bundle of muses. You know, the ancient Greeks had the, the various muses that they used as a way to describe the creative impulse in people. There was Calliope was the muse of eloquence, and Terpsichore was the muse of dance, and there were muse of architecture, and muses of literature. And uh, it, to me, that's a, sort of a, 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 a set of doorways into the unconscious, the grand dreamscape on which we all float on our little boats. <laughs> uh, that's just my way of looking at it. And I think that there are gigantic forces that are, are there, and we're all walking around with them, and yeah, our muses are sort of our, our, our windows you know, through, a, through a glass darkly. And if they're buffed up a bit and the, with an art or a, or a practice or, or a passion, then suddenly they become available. Um, and 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 it, I think they are growable. You hear, oh, she was at the height of her powers when she wrote that fifth novel, or he was at the height of his powers when he wrote that fifth symphony. And that presupposes that powers, creative powers, grow. They're not just, oh, they don't just arrive, they are usually the product of a lot of hard work. And the, I think the harder the work, 
one puts into developing whatever talent one has, or even discovering one that one did not know one had, the more buffed and clear that window to the muse becomes. And then you, there's, the, so you develop a kind of a vehicle for something that is already there. I always believed that. Uh, and that's how, how, how I've come to look at it. And it really is a kind of experience where, you know, the beginning of an epic poem, the Homer would say, oh, you know, God has come and sit at my shoulder and pour ideas into my head, please, because little old me, I just am I'm about to embark upon a gigantic enterprise, please help me. And that is a very useful way to look at it. It's a sort of, a, you could call it an intellectual conceit or not, but, or you could call it a practice, but either way, it's very helpful to get out of its way often. Yeah, I don't know, what do you think? Oh, well, I think, you know, the, you've uh, captured it perfectly, really, that uh, twofold process to perspiration and inspiration. Uh, I mean, if I can just uh, move to the classroom experience, sort of being outside yourself becomes very important. There's that process of collecting every all the information and the ideas, bringing them together, and that. But there has to be that moment where somehow you move outside yourself and you're thinking, how do I communicate this? How, and you're thinking about audience and not, you know, just what's, what's in your head, but how do, I, how do I convey this? How do I communicate it? But your, your first question was really interesting too. That is, and I, I think the, the internet, the beauty of the internet is that many stories that were not told before can be told. That is, we don't have the gatekeepers, the multiple gatekeepers that we once had. Uh, the priests of high culture are not priests any, anymore. Uh, they've been taken down a notch at least, and so there has been um, an enabling of, it may be that not everyone will read it, but you have a chance to put it out there in some form. I think this will have to be our last question. Go ahead. Um, hi, thanks for being here. I really enjoy this. Um, first, a brief comment about uh, muses and genius inspired by your previous comments is uh, Elizabeth Gilbert has a marvelous talk at TED.com, um, speaking of accessible online, where she talks about, uh, she's the author of Eat, Pray, Love, among other books, which has been wildly popular. And she talks about uh, how the ancient Greeks had this idea of genius not as a quality that a person has innate to them, but as something that they are visited by. And a genius might inhabit a room, almost like a genie. Um, and that when people would come up to her and say, oh, well, after she had published and was so successful, well, uh, come up to her with concern and say, well, oh, how does it feel knowing that this is probably the, the peak of your career and it's only downhill from here? Uh, <laughs> and so she has some great comments about that. But um, what I wanted to comment on and ask about is that stories have a marvelous way of making the past real and bringing it alive, um, but they can also help make the future seem more real and alive and help people envision possibilities of things to come. Um, I'm a big fan of science fiction, especially things like Star Trek, which envision a future of humanity working together and moving beyond our petty problems. And um, so I wanted to ask, uh, one, if you have, any of you have comments on storytelling and its ability to, or its use as a tool to help people envision possible futures, um, and also, uh, I guess for odds especially as a storyteller, do you have any stories that you tell um, that you feel are especially about the future in particular and not about the past or about potential presence, but more explicitly about possible futures? Jules Verne, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, long before Einstein brought up relativity and the power of the atom was possible, wrote about the Nautilus, a, 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 a craft powered by atomic energy. And I don't know how many decades afterwards, there was the very first US naval atomic submarine named the Nautilus. Uh, and 
I, I think that uh, you, you, if you take a look at Star Wars, all we, we need there is a, a technology and a, and a knowledge that we do not yet have that it needs very badly to be discovered fairly soon <laughs> that will allow us to uh, be able to um, tr uh, cr go across the gulf of space because in conventional tin cans, there, it's absolutely impossible to get anywhere. Uh, even though the movies tell us, we're go oh, we, let, let's go to, suddenly you're, on an, you're at, in another galaxy in another planet. Uh, and that may have to do with uh, wormholes and whatnot, who, know who knows? Um, I think that there is that, that, that premonitory activity, and it's almost exclusively in science fiction. I, I don't, uh, the, in my storytelling, my performance storytelling, I don't uh, offer any stories like that, but I, do, I am working on novels and screenplays, and a lot of them are about possible futures. But that sort of falls out of the context of, uh, of this evening's discussion. A lot of them are, are rather worried about uh, the biosphere, basically. I think you actually also get it in fairy tales, um, the premonitory power, that is the ability to envision a future, a utopia, uh, something that may never be, but to explore these sorts of perils and possibilities. And, and then, I, not in fairy tales, but in fiction in general, just being able to imagine the lives of others. That is not, maybe not the future, but the lives of, of people who, whom you'll never encounter in real life. You know, to learn, one, someone in a question mentioned getting to know about other, other cultures, and you can do that through books. Uh, you can make those sorts of discoveries. Okay, so thank you, Odds Botkin, and thank you, Maria Tatar. Um. Thank you, Sasha. <laughs>